Life had a funny way of unfolding in our small, suburban corner of the world. I, Nancy, navigated the steady ebb and flow of life as a bank teller, while my husband, Tom, managed the intricate dance of municipal politics. Our home was a testament to Tom's family, a house passed down through generations, now echoing with the remnants of our conversations and debates. It was a typical Thursday evening, and I was rummaging through the kitchen, prepping for dinner. The aroma of cooking filled the air, a small comfort in the otherwise silent house. Tom, dinner is nearly ready. I called out, my voice bouncing off the walls. He strolled into the kitchen, his face buried in the day's mail. Hmm, smells good. What's the occasion? His voice carried a hint of sarcasm, typical after a long day at the office. Just trying to keep things interesting, I replied, setting the table. You know, spice up our routine. Tom smirked, dropping the pile of envelopes on the counter. Routine is good, Nancy. Keeps things predictable. That was Tom always preferring the predictable, the controlled, and the comfortable. I often wondered what ran through his mind as he sifted through city issues, what dreams he chased within the confines of his calculated world. As we sat down to eat, the conversation drifted to mundane things, the leaky faucet, the Jones new car, and the upcoming city council meeting. It was all so painfully normal until the mention of my family. So, your nephew's coming this weekend? Tom asked, his fork pausing midair. Yeah, they are. Bobby's got a soccer game nearby. Thought they'd crash here afterward, I replied, trying to gauge his reaction. Tom's face hardened slightly. Great, more chaos. Just what we need. Oh, come on, Tom. They're just kids. Plus, it's nice having family around, don't you think? I chided, hoping to lighten his mood. Family's fine in small doses. But your brother's kids, they run around like wild animals. And that farm smell seems to follow them here. His words stung, an all-too-frequent reminder of the life I left behind and the world he never understood or cared to. They're just excited, Tom. And they're my family. They're part of me, I said firmly, my patience waning. Tom sighed, putting down his fork. I know, I know. But can't they just tone it down a bit? I shook my head, frustration simmering beneath the surface. They're kids, Tom. They don't tone it down. That's what kids do, they play, they laugh, they make noise. The rest of the meal passed in a tense silence, the clinking of cutlery against plates filling the void between us. It was in these moments that I felt the distance growing, the gap widening between his world and mine. The morning buzzed with the usual flurry of activity, the kind that fills every working household. I was gulping down my coffee, already running through the day's tasks in my head, when my phone rang. It was an unusual time for a call, and seeing my brother's name flash on the screen sent a ripple of worry through me. Hey, Jake, what's up? I answered, trying to keep my voice even. Nancy, it's dad. He's, he's sick, real sick. Jake's voice was strained, each word heavy with concern. I felt the air leave the room, my hand tightening around the phone. What do you mean sick? What's happened? He's got cancer, Nancy. It's bad. The doctors are talking all sorts of treatments, but it's gonna cost a fortune. Jake's voice broke, the reality of our situation setting in. My mind raced, thoughts of dad, the farm, and those childhood days flooding back. Okay, okay. Let's figure this out. How much are we talking about? I can help. I could hear the hesitation in Jake's voice. It's a lot, Nancy. More than any of us got. They're talking about treatments, chemo, maybe more. It's all just, a lot. My heart ached, an overwhelming urge to fix it all taking hold. I'll talk to Tom. We can use some savings, maybe get a loan. We'll find a way. With a heavy heart, I hung up and turned to find Tom standing in the doorway, a questioning look on his face. Everything okay? he asked, his voice laced with a casual concern. I took a deep breath, the weight of the news anchoring me to the spot. It's my dad. 
He's sick, really sick. Cancer. It's bad, Tom. Tom's expression shifted, the news landing with a thud. Jesus, Nancy. I'm sorry. What, what do you need? We need money for treatment. A lot of it. I want to help, Tom. I need to help, I said, the words tumbling out, a mix of desperation and determination. Tom ran a hand through his hair, the gears turning. Money, huh? That's gonna be tight. But, okay, we'll look at our finances, see what we can do. I nodded, the first wave of relief washing over me. Thank you. I knew I could count on you. The rest of the morning was a blur, calls to the hospital, more conversations with Jake, and a deep dive into our savings account. The numbers swirled before me, daunting yet necessary. This was family, and nothing was too big or too hard when it came to family. The day dad arrived at our place was one I'd been dreading and longing for an equal measure. Tom had been oddly agreeable about dad staying with us, which should have been my first clue that something was off. As soon as dad's car pulled into the driveway, I rushed out, my heart aching at the sight of him. He was a shell of the robust man I remembered, his frame hunched, his face drawn with pain and weariness. Nancy, my girl, he said, his voice weak, but filled with warmth as I helped him inside. Tom came out to greet us, his smile a little too stiff, a little too forced. Welcome, Mr. Williams. Let me show you to your room. The evening passed in a sort of anxious dance, dad trying to appear stronger than he was, Tom playing the gracious host, and me, caught in the middle, worrying about everything unsaid. As we sat down to dinner, a heavy silence enveloped the table. Tom was the first to break it, his voice cutting through the stillness like a knife. So, Mr. Williams, I've been thinking about your situation. I want to help, really I do. Dad nodded, a wary look in his eyes. That's kind of you, Tom. I appreciate all the support. But, Tom continued, I think it's only fair we discuss some, terms. Terms? My stomach twisted at the word, a sense of dread, creeping up my spine. What do you mean, Tom? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Tom looked between Dad and me, his gaze calculating. Well, it's simple really. I'll cover the medical expenses, allow you to stay here, but in return, I want the farm. All of it, transferred to me and Nancy. I stared at him, disbelief and anger churning inside me. Are you serious right now? You can't be serious. Dad's expression hardened, his tired eyes suddenly alight with a spark of the old fire. You want my land, my home, in exchange for helping me? It's a fair deal, don't you think? Tom said, leaning back in his chair. A small price to pay for your health and comfort. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This was my husband, the man I'd vowed to spend my life with, and he was bargaining over my father's life like it was a business transaction. Tom, you can't do this. It's not right. It's, it's disgusting, I spat out, the words tasting bitter in my mouth. Dad pushed his chair back, his body trembling with a mix of rage and effort. I don't want your money, Tom. Not like this. I'd rather die than give you everything I've worked for. The room spun around me, the walls closing in. This was a nightmare, a terrible, heartless game, and Tom was revealing himself to be the villain. Fine, Tom said, his voice cold. Then you leave. Both of you. I won't be taken for a fool. With that, Dad grabbed his cane, his pride the only thing keeping him upright. I followed, my mind a whirlwind of hurt, anger, and disbelief. Tom, I can't believe you. I won't let you do this to my family, I said, my voice trembling. But he didn't respond, his face set in a mask of indifference. We packed a few things, Dad's weak protests echoing in my ears. This was it. The facade had crumbled, and the man I thought I knew had vanished, replaced by a stranger with cold eyes and a colder heart. We didn't speak much on the drive to the small rental I'd managed to find on short notice. It wasn't much, but it was a roof over our heads, 
a place to regroup and figure out our next steps. Once inside, I helped Dad to the couch, his body sinking into the cushions with a weary sigh. Nancy, I'm sorry. I never should have put you in this position, he murmured, his eyes downcast. No, Dad. Don't you dare apologize. This is on Tom, not you. I can't believe he'd do something like this, I replied, my voice fierce with anger. Dad shook his head, a bitter laugh escaping him. And to think I almost considered it, for a moment, to make sure you'd be taken care of. That's exactly why I'm doing all this, Dad. You took care of me my whole life. It's my turn now, I said, squeezing his hand. The following days were a blur of doctor's appointments, phone calls, and late-night internet searches for any financial aid we might qualify for. I was running on adrenaline and coffee, determined to find a way to afford Dad's treatment. One evening, after a particularly grueling day, I came back to the rental to find Dad sitting at the small kitchen table, a stack of bills in front of him. Nancy, sit down. We need to talk about this. Realistically, he said, his voice steady but tired. I pulled up a chair, my stomach in knots. What is it, Dad? He pushed the bills toward me, his finger tapping on the total amount due. This is more than you can handle, Nancy. I can't let you ruin your life for me. Tears pricked at my eyes, but I blinked them back. Dad, I'm not having this conversation. I'll find a way. We'll find a way. Together. Dad reached across the table, his rough hand covering mine. Nancy, listen to me. I've lived a good life. I've seen you grow into a remarkable woman. If it's my time, then so be it. But you, you have so much more to live for. Don't let this destroy you. I shook my head, pulling my hand away. No. I refuse to accept that. We're going to fight this, Dad. Until the very end. The determination in my voice seemed to give Dad a small spark of hope, or perhaps he just didn't have the heart to argue any further. We spent the rest of the evening in a quiet, mutual understanding, both of us too stubborn and too scared to consider giving up. Days turned into weeks, and despite the ever-present shadow of illness and financial strain, we found small moments of joy, old stories retold, laughter shared over simple meals, and quiet evenings watching whatever was on TV. It wasn't much, but it was ours, and for the moment, it was enough. Three months had flown by in a blur of hospital visits, a relentless battle against the merciless tide of illness. Despite our best efforts and boundless hope, my father's condition deteriorated under the weight of the aggressive cancer. It was a losing fight, but one we endured together, with the stubbornness and heart that characterized our simple, hardworking family. My father's passing was quiet, a gentle surrender in the early hours of a gray morning. The pain of losing him was sharp, a raw wound that seemed to echo through the empty spaces of our rented home. The funeral was a somber affair, filled with hushed voices and tear-stained faces, a final goodbye to a man who had been the bedrock of our family. After the guests had left, the condolences spoken, and the last of the dishes put away, I sat with my brother, Jake, on the porch of our family home. The air was heavy with unspoken words, a shared grief hanging between us. Emma, he was so proud of you. We both are. You did everything you could. I nodded, the weight of grief a tangible thing on my shoulders. I just wish it could have been different. Jake hugged me, and we stood there, in the fading light, saying goodbye to our father, to a part of our lives that we'd never get back. The days after the funeral were heavy and quiet, filled with the kind of emptiness that follows a storm. I spent long hours staring at the land, our land, stretching out with rows of corn and the old oak tree standing tall against the skyline. It was more than just soil and crops, it was Dad's legacy, a testament to his life's work. Jake and I had been going through Dad's papers, trying to sort out his affairs, when I stumbled upon a series of letters and notes. They were inquiries and offers on the land, some dated back a few months, others more recent. Each one hinted at the value of the land, suggesting it was set to skyrocket with the city's expansion plans. Jake, look at this. I called out, my hand trembling slightly as I held out the papers. He came over, 
his eyes scanning the documents quickly. What the hell? These offers are huge, Nancy. And they're all pretty recent. I nodded, the pieces of the puzzle starting to click into place. It makes sense now. This is why Tom was so eager to get his hands on the land. He knew about this, somehow. He knew and tried to use Dad's illness to pressure us into signing it over. Jake's face darkened, a mix of anger and disbelief etched into his features. That snake. Using our own dad's sickness for his gain. We've got to do something about this, Nancy. I agreed, the fire of determination igniting within me. We will. We'll make sure this land stays in the family, just like dad wanted. And as for Tom, he's going to regret ever trying to cheat us. The next few days were a whirlwind of activity. We met with lawyers, talked to the city planners, and started to piece together a plan. The land was indeed about to become very valuable, and we were determined to protect it, to ensure it benefited the family and honored dad's memory. But as we dug deeper, the reality of the situation became clear. We were up against more than just greedy land speculators, we were dealing with a network of information and influence, and at the center of it all was Tom. One evening, as Jake and I sat exhausted from another day of meetings and calls, the phone rang. It was Tom, his voice smooth and eerily calm. Nancy, we need to talk. I've been hearing things, about the land. I think we can come to an agreement, something beneficial for both of us. I felt a surge of disgust listening to him, the man I had once loved, now nothing more than a conniving stranger. There's nothing to talk about, Tom. You tried to cheat my family, to take advantage of my father's death. You're not getting a single inch of that land, I replied, my voice steely and resolute. Tom let out a dry laugh. Nancy, don't be naive. This is business. I was just trying to secure our future, our wealth. Let's meet, discuss this like adults. I clenched the phone tighter, the anger boiling inside me. The only business I'll be discussing with you is the divorce. You'll be hearing from my lawyer, Tom. Goodbye. The days following my final conversation with Tom were fraught with a tense anticipation. Jake and I had enlisted a sharp-witted lawyer, Mr. Henderson, who specialized in estate and property law. He was a no-nonsense type, with a keen eye for detail and a deep understanding of the underhanded tactics used by those looking to exploit others. We sat in Mr. Henderson's office, the walls lined with legal tomes and certificates, as he laid out the strategy. Now, Nancy and Jake, I've seen this type of thing before. Wealthy individuals trying to cash in on insider information. It's illegal and immoral. We're going to fight this, and we're going to win. I nodded, my resolve hardening. What do we need to do? I want to make sure Tom pays for what he tried to do. Mr. Henderson adjusted his glasses, his eyes sharp. First, we gather all the evidence. The offers on the land, the communications from Tom, anything that can show his intent and knowledge of the land's value. Jake leaned forward, his brow furrowed. We've got plenty of that. Emails, letters, even some voicemails he left Nancy. Good, Mr. Henderson replied, that's a start. Next, we file for an injunction to prevent any sale or transfer of the land until this is resolved. That will protect your asset. The next few weeks were a blur of legal motions, affidavits, and tense waiting. Tom, it seemed, was not going down without a fight. His own lawyers were pushing back, painting him as an innocent party, just trying to take care of his sick father-in-law. But we had the truth on our side, and slowly, the evidence began to pile up against him. The turning point came when one of Tom's associates, caught up in another investigation, decided to turn state's evidence, providing a direct link between Tom and the speculators looking to buy the land. The day we received the news, Jake and I met at the local diner, a spot we'd come to frequent for its strong coffee and quiet corners. Nancy, this is it. This guy's testimony is going to nail Tom. He's not getting out of this, Jake said, a hint of triumph in his voice. I sipped my coffee, the bitterness a match for my mood. Good. He deserves everything that's coming to him. 
I just wish it hadn't come to this, you know? Jake reached across the table, his hand covering mine. I know, sis, but you're doing the right thing. Protecting the land, our family. It's what dad would have wanted. The trial was a spectacle, the media latching onto the story of a local official caught in a web of greed and deceit. Tom's face was plastered on every news outlet, the details of his scheming laid bare for all to see. And when the verdict came down, guilty on all counts, I felt a strange mixture of relief and sadness. Relief that justice had been served, but sadness for the man I had once loved, now just a shadow of his former self. The courthouse steps were behind us, the weight of months of legal battles lifted. I took a deep breath, the air tasting fresher, sweeter somehow. Jake and I walked in silence, each lost in thought, until we reached the old diner that had become our haven. Sliding into the booth, the familiar clatter of dishes and murmur of conversation wrapped around us like a comforting blanket. Jake ordered us coffee, and we sat, the steam curling up between us. You know, Nancy, I think this is the first time I've seen you look relaxed in months, Jake said, a small smile playing at the corners of his mouth. I laughed, a genuine, light sound that felt foreign after all this time. Yeah, it's over, isn't it? I can finally move on, start fresh. He nodded, his eyes warm. You've got a whole new life ahead of you, sis. What's the plan? I stirred my coffee, the spoon clinking against the mug. Well, I've been thinking. I want to do something with the land. Not sell it off or anything, but maybe start a community garden, or a space for kids to learn about farming. Something that would make dad proud. Jake's eyes lit up, enthusiasm radiating from him. That's a fantastic idea, Nancy. You always had a knack for dreaming big. I'm in, whatever you need. We spent the next hour talking excitedly about the possibilities, the dream taking shape between us. It felt good, right, to be planning for the future instead of reeling from the past. As we left the diner, the sun setting in a blaze of orange and pink, I felt a sense of peace settle over me. The fight was over, but the journey was just beginning. I made my way to the small apartment I'd called home since leaving Tom. It was modest, but it was mine, a sanctuary from the world outside. Opening the door, I stepped inside, the quiet enveloping me. I wandered over to the window, the view stretching out to the city skyline in the distance. The land, our land, lay between here and there, a green expanse filled with potential and promise. The phone rang, startling me from my reverie. I picked it up, a familiar voice on the other end. Hey, Emma, it's Lucy, from the bank. I heard about everything, and I just wanted to say, if you need anything, we're all here for you. I smiled, touched by the offer. Thanks, Lucy. I appreciate it. Actually, there might be something. I'm thinking of starting a project on the land, something community-focused. Maybe the bank could be a part of it? Lucy's excitement was palpable, even through the phone. Absolutely, Emma. That sounds amazing. Let's set up a meeting, talk about what you need. We'd love to be involved. Hanging up, I felt a surge of excitement. The project was more than just a dream now, it was a possibility, a real, tangible future. I sat down, a small notebook and pen in hand, and began to jot down ideas, plans, names. The page filled up quickly, a testament to the flurry of thoughts and hopes swirling through my mind. It was a new beginning, not just for me, but for the community, for the legacy of the land. And as I wrote, I could almost feel Dad's presence, his quiet strength and unwavering support guiding me forward. The path ahead was uncharted, filled with challenges and opportunities but I was ready. Ready to build, to grow, and to thrive. This was more than just a new chapter, it was a whole new book, and I was the author, pen in hand, ready to write a story of hope, perseverance, and renewal. The end was just the beginning.